but I just want to again remind people that the schedule for the boot camp, well, whilst it is evolving, um, contains for for most sessions a summary of of key take home messages, key points, um, and either before the session or on initiation of the session or after, it may be helpful, I think it probably would be helpful um, for most to, to review those points because they include some of the most, uh, you know, the most salient to the point that I'm trying to make, the, the biggest take home messages uh, are often included in that. So I would just draw your attention to that and, um, and recognize that um, uh, while I'll try to communicate things verbally. There is this point of reference that I tried to compile, that tries to boil it down into you know paragraphs. Okay, um, so just bear that in mind. That's in the um, in the schedule. Great, um, and uh, okay. So um, I think we will jump in to some of the material then. I'm. I think I'll uh, leave this shared here, but um, we're going to take on a topic which has some conceptual side um, that I'd like to depart from tradition and sort of cover alongside the practical explication of these points, um, in part because it's, it's actually not too many points I want to cover beforehand, but I, <coughs> excuse me, I want to um, make sure I can communicate um, some general features. And, and specifically what we're going to be talking about this afternoon is um, spatially situated agents and, um, and mobility uh, within those situated environments. And, uh, and um, these are features of certainly most agent-based modeling environment, uh, systems that one can have situated agents and agents that are situated in space, not only with respect to networks. Um, now we'll look at any logics kind of um, version of this, um, which, which contains some, uh, Particular, you know, idiosyncrasies or, or features or, or characteristics, um, but bear in mind that once again the, the general points being made here are, are more general. And you know, there's um, when you see models with spatial components, one question that it's often good to ask is, you know, why do we incorporate spatial location into a model? Thus far, I I, I want to remind us that um, we actually did place um, uh, in some of the models we built up some you know, spatial elements. So we actually, for example, with this model of, of tobacco use and, and, and social influence thereon, uh, we actually placed people in space and, and we had <clears throat> people connected if they lay within a certain distance of it, of a, a distant space network. Um, but, you know, space wasn't being used there in any particularly deep fashion. Um, what, it, what, it, what it did do is provide kind of an approximation to an environment where people were scattered around some landscape and, and uh, people exhibited, I think what we call pro, propinquity. They were close together. Um, uh, they were sort of coupled and, and shared characteristics or in this case, network connection with people close to them in space. Um, so we kind of used it as a convenient mechanism for sort of hitching people up in localized networks. But we weren't really taking advantage of the spatial elements of the model in any sort of substantive way. Um, some of the models we ran this morning, hybrid models, had more substantial uses of space. For example, they had resources like clinics that, to which people would present, which clinics they would go to would depend on what was 
closest to them. Um, and, uh, you know, there'd be workplaces which were contaminated or homes that were contaminated. Mm. Um, and it's, it's worth reflecting on, you know, what, why, why might we want to create you know, spatial representation? And, um, you know, I think there's, there's, it says two options, but it's, it's not, um, not actually the appropriate apropos title. Um, you know, why might you have um, 2D spatial embedding? Why might you put people in space? Well, there's a, a number of reasons that often pop up. Um, you have local influence or local transmission. It could be transmission of pathogen, norms, um, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, sometimes even behaviors, like imitative behaviors, um, you know, which may be necessary for some of your interests. Um, you want to capture the fact that people influence people more by them, um, that physical proximity can influence. In other cases, you want to capture differential access to, to resources that may be spatially limited. You want to capture food deserts so that, for example, um, food is more readily available um, uh, in some areas of the city, maybe um, areas of the city that are better off. And it's less uh, easily available in other areas. Um, or maybe it's uh, access to healthcare um, uh, that is inconvenient for those in rural regions and it's easier for those in certain urban neighborhoods and less easy for those in, you know, in um, lower income or, or lower social access. Um, you might be interested in certain phenomena um, like spatial concentration of pollutant near highways or near near polluted sites. Um, uh, and uh, that may you know, be of a particular interest when it comes to people's risk exposure, you know, PPM 2.5 or whatever inhalation might be really important point of interest. Um, and um, there may be other components associated with this where like you have effects um, spreading over the landscape, um, um, floods moving over the landscape or traffic jams or, or what have you. Um, and sometimes you're interested in comparing patterns from the model that emerge against empirical observations. Maybe, you know, you have pollutant levels and or you have walkability indices, and you want to see if they induce in the model patterns of health disparities or, or health uh, variability across the landscape that are reflective of what you see in here. Um, uh, so these are some reasons you might have spatial embedding. And spatial embedding, one particular type of it is GIS embedding, so geographic where the spatial component is in fact geographic, not merely sort of an abstract, um, an abstract space. Um, and, and both types are reasonably common within the um, So, you know, um, within geographic context, um, commonly there are a particular uses. And you can bring these over as well to spatial uses, but, um, but often they're they're most naturally explored in a geographic. Way. So you might want to, you know, explore how far from an agent's home, for example, are fresh fruit, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, clinics, uh, health services. You might want to capture constraints on on movement. Um, that that movement is constrained to occur only in in in, in certain lines in ways that might expose them to particular risks. Um, uh, you might want to associate agents with certain types of um, of resources to which they have access by or to risks of exposure um, uh, and and you know sometimes your simulation itself augments the GIS data so the fact that agents are moving in a certain area may lead to um, uh, some sort of change in the crime index within that area or it may lead to some sort of um, 
change in the pollutant of things, prions. Um, uh, so, you know, here uh, often we're, we're using GIS data on a landscape together with the model. The model generates patterns which um, are also geographic, but it may simply be that it induces health effects that are, are spent, you know, felt across the population. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there is a need often to capture not merely exposures at home, but mobility patterns, patterns of, of movement over the landscape. Now, there's two options that are commonly used in any logic um, for this at, at a broad level. The, the first will have two sub variants one geographic and one not. So continuous embedding. So where someone's location is, is a continuous factor within the model, um, uh, and there's no mutual exclusion. You can have agents as close or as far from each other um, as desired, but um, uh, but where they're they're located at spatial positions that are, that are uh, continuous. The other is a discrete environment where they're in Patches. We saw a glimpse of this today with Congo's game of life. And if we may, some of you may have looked at shelling segregation model, and that also has um, has these cells. And finally, I showed you the agent-based predator prey map. So here we're divided into columns and rows. It's kind of a grid, um, and there's mutually exclu mutual exclusion there. Only for each patch, only one or zero agents can be present in that path. Uh, so that's kind of a physical exclusion. There can only be one length in the path, only one pair in the path. Um, now, um, we looked at the game of life this morning. Um, I sort of pointed out a, a one where you had, um, say, uh, a grid, and, and maybe you have um, uh, sea lice in different um, different patches. and and salmon that are being farmed in those different patches. And the sea lice can move between these patches and the salmon are blocked by nets. And sea lice uh, infest salmon and, and um, uh, they end up causing a lot of, lot of trouble. Um, so here um, you have this kind of uh, element in, in a gridded, gridded framework um, and uh, if, you, if you go look, I have a model that I've provided to you that sort of situates people in with different levels of crowding that are kind of stylized representations of, of um, uh, their income based on crowding, based on, on uh, low SES to high SES. Maybe we'll go open that and you can take a look. Um, um, it's actually a pretty easily built model. And if there were, you know, uh, demand for it, that that is something which, which could be built um, in this boot camp. So I'm going to uh, go open said model and we will um, see if we can uh, go and, and, and take a look at it for a moment. So it's in example models, okay? And um, this is here in SIRS, Crowding disparity version 13 was gratified projected stage two. We, we won't be exploring all aspects of it. But if you go double click on that, um, we'll, we can do download and we'll get it down on our computer. Let's go open this. And, and I, I just want to give you a flavor of what I'm talking about, sort of a stylized depiction of crowding. So this model is a model of vectors with z spread. Um, uh, pretty bog simple in terms of uh, familiar components. Um, I'd like to uh, go go run it with with a large population, assuming the population size of a thousand. I'm going to right click on that scenario. We'll run that scenario. Um, other scenarios change how long people have immunity for, et cetera. So here people are are located in a network and their location is dictated by a characteristic of that person. Each person has an income, you can see it here. 
the incomes are not distributed uniformly. If you go look at the rule for income, they're drawn from a log normal distribution. Remember, the characteristics of the population are specified by that population. I guess this rule for how to determine these parameter values for each person in the population, remember that? So we'll go through each person in the population and draw the values from, from here. Um, so we have a log normal distribution in income. And guess what? Their location in space, their X location, is based on their income level. So who are these people over here on the left? Anyone want to guess? Those are people with, I'll give you a hint. This is increasing X along here. I can make one person up. So who are these people on the left? People with low income. And because it's log normally distributed, there's a disproportionate set of people down there, right? It, it, it would be something like, um, be something, maybe I'll favor this board, unfortunately. Um, uh, I should probably do it here because people remotely might not otherwise see it um, as readily, but it might look something like, like this, uh, the log normal distribution. Um, the log of it is normal, normally distributed when you take an exponent as its long tail goes up. Um, and so you have a disproportionate number of people in this lower income segment who are sort of crowded into a little area of, of income space or of physical space, X location. So, so they're crowded there. And as a result, they have lots of network connections. And guess what? The network connections mean they're at much greater risk of catching this bug, right? Um, it sort of stays at high levels within that area. Um, and, and if you go run it, you'll find, you know, the fractional prevalence in the population as a whole kind of goes up and then it, it oscillates around. The incident case count as a whole does that. But you, you'll see real disparities between like low income versus high income. And that is emergent. This is the connection, this is the connection count. How many connections higher income people tend to have? Well, um, that's that's kind of over here and, and they tend to have fewer, um, uh, whereas lower income people tend to have more. Um, and that induces in terms, uh, that in, in turn induces you know, infection count. So over time, people have more and more infections. High income, there's a disproportionate number that have not gotten infected yet because they can seal themselves off and protect themselves. Does sound familiar? Um, and um, here's for low income, you can see that it, you know, it's, it's increasing as over time. There's this disparity, which is rising between kind of the mean value of for for high income and low income. Um, and you can look at this income level, that's the x-axis, versus personal infection count, right? As as their income rises, each dot here is a person. And what you'll find is the lower income people tend to have more infections. You know, you, you this number of infections that they've experienced goes down as income goes up and then it drops off. This is a model that has space in it. Right, but it's it's a very stylized form of space. It's a very abstract form of space. And it, 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 it's used to impose crowding, et cetera. But it's it's useful. It plays plays a useful role. It's a little elegant model that shows the effect of, of crowding. Um. Okay, so um, you know that was a, a little example of. Um, of a model, no, no mobility there. They just stayed in place. But for a lot of our models, we want them to be mobile. We want them to move around. So it was an interesting model we just looked at that it gave interesting results, but people were stationary. And we wanna ask what if we incorporate mobility into the model, right? And um, it's interesting. And in aggregate modeling will often have like a mixing matrix of you know, I have connections with some group of people and a certain fraction of them are with this group or that group or that group. 
we just say of my connections, a certain fraction are like that. In agent-based modeling, often, not always, but often that's generated, that is produced by the model by virtue of people going to school, going to workplaces, going home, spending time at home. That induces a mixing matrix. That induces a pattern of connect of contact. So the fact that you know, kids often have siblings of similar ages I mean there's a lot of connections through the day of kids with you know, kids in age. The fact they go to school and they're in certain classes with kids of similar age I means they have a lot of connections with kids their age. Um, and the fact that adults will often go to a workplace, you know, an asterisk these days, go to a workplace and spend time there. I mean, they have a lot of connections with other adults. These are emergent features. In an agent-based modeling perspective, you know, for, for, for some interventions that may be important. If you want to ask about the impacts of interventions that would cut workplaces, you know, ask people to work from home, that can be a very important thing to have. If you just have a mixing matrix, it's not clear how that changes. But if you understand where these patterns of mixing are coming from, how much from home, how much from workplace, how much from school, you can start to analyze the situation better, like how much you know, mask rules in school might help, or how much you know, um, uh, the quinting system might help in schools or rotating classrooms and all these sort of innovations that came up during the pandemic at various times. Um, and you could say, okay, what's the mixing matrix now? You take people out of workplaces and you bring them home um, and, and then they spend more time together. They have more contacts with each other, but fewer with outside. And the agent-based model can nicely capture that. Um, which is often advantageous. You have mobility that induces um, induces you know, patterns at a at a higher level. Um, so uh, so in spatial embedding, we, we talked we have discrete cells um, and we have continuous embedding, and you can have agent movement in either one. In in, in the first of them, sorry, the continuous one. Agents move in a certain direction with a certain speed. We're going to actually build a little more. By contrast, with discrete, they hop. They hop around. They hop around to space. They like zip over to another area of space. They move. Think the shelling segregation model. They move to a certain, you know, neighborhood or what have you. Um, and. Um, they can move to a neighboring area, but but it's um, generally they sort of jump to cell. And and I have some comments on how this is done and in any logic. They can move to the next cell. I could say north, south, east, west, but they're in either this cell or that cell or that cell. Whereas in continuous embedding, they're moving in a certain direction with a certain speed. Um, and uh, you know, in discrete space, they can find an empty cell, and you can get agents at a certain cell, et cetera. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to go light on this this issue of time because I don't I don't want to um, muddle muddle up things too much. But I may come back to the fact that many of these discrete space models are also discrete time models, and um, you have time broken up into ticks or, or steps. Okay, so what I've just done is give you a glimpse of um, some issues with space. There's spatial location as a characteristic of agents um, and something that might influence those agents, which agents might influence in their impacts on the environment. And then there's issues of mobility. Hmm? Mobility around that space. This can be continuous, or for more stylized models, it can be discrete. Think game of life. Um, let's can we build up a model. Are we okay with that? Let's try our hands at building up a little model, and it's going to relate to my point about mixing and moving around and exposure. Um, so let's go. Let's go try our hand at one of these continuous spatial models. 
they can actually be quite fun to work with. They can be quite, quite thought provoking and, and, and helpful for as thinking tools. Actually, there's a lot of a lot of things that are not obvious. Uh, okay, so we're going to build ourselves a new model. Mm -mm. Build ourselves a new model. Maybe I'll stop my recording and we'll we'll stop. We'll start again for this part because now we're transitioning to build 